It's Torah talk. 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 We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. A Torah Institute podcast. <laughs> it's the Torah Zone. Elohim spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. You have no other mighty ones against my face. You do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. You do not bring the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to naught, for Yahuwah does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to naught. Remember the Sabbath day, to set it apart. Six days you labor, and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahuwah Baruch the Sabbath day, and set it apart. Respect your father and your mother, so that your days are prolonged upon the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. You do not murder, you do not commit adultery, you do not steal, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. You do not covet your neighbor's house, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Welcome to Torah Talk, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Torah Talk, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. How was your week, brother? It's insane oh, time here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's been really wacky. Uh, everybody's saying Happy New Year. You know. Oh, that's the new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's coming out for them, but uh, our new year actually uh, starts in, well, uh, in the springtime, you know, awesome. Awesome. it's supposed to. Of course, that's spring for us, but it would be fall for you because it's a, Yahuwah was talking about when it was, the event happened, it was for those that were in the northern hemisphere, the entire planet has to pay attention. Of course, some people are thinking upside down, they're going six months later, but um, <clears throat> That's Passover for us, isn't it? Right, Passover. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that's when uh, it's the, the first moon, the first moon of the year. Mm. I was uh, looking for someone's name right there. See, <laughs> I, I have a stack of these things now. I, I've gotten a collection of flashcards, yeah. and mm. oh yeah, these are awesome. Yeah, um, and we're all learning, you know, and continuing to discover, make discoveries. You know, one of the things that people wonder about is, you know, what was nailed to the to the 
stake, or they, the Christians say, what was nailed to the cross? Well, we know that it was Yahusha that was nailed to the, cro to the stake, the, the, the tree. So, uh, but what, was, what did it represent? You know, and the Christians say, oh, that was the law. <laughs> you know, that, that defines sin. Yeah. That, and he's taken it out of the way. Well, actually what we have is uh, in Colossians, there's a word that they translate. And in the Greek, it's uh, something like uh, cherographon, you know, and the word is actually an unused word in any other case but a legal case. It's a legal word in the legal profession, you know, and it actually means a list of your transgressions. It's not the, the the thing that defines the transgressions that's nailed to the to the stake. It's the list of your transgressions, which is a legal term that a, that would happen in a courtroom. And all of your accusations that were on a list have been completely wiped clean and justified by what was done by the shedding of his blood. And people have been so uh, misguided that they haven't understood because what was the list of the of the transgressions that a courtroom would have against a criminal which would in this case be me or you or any of the uh, people on the earth the list of their transgressions in the in the courtroom w that the adversary would want to accuse us of mm -hmm. is taken away it's a list of the uh, a list of the transgressions in ordinances Against the ordinances, it's not the the ordinances that are that are uh, on display. It's the thing that was done was the casting away of the of the evidence against us that was taken away, and it was put on open display for the entire universe. So that's a remarkable interpretation. What was that and word? <laughs> what was that word you said? Cherographon. It's a Greek word. And what word would uh, the Christians be using? Well, they would be using uh, the in Colossians. They would be talking about the ordinances that were taken away, that were that were wiped out or nailed to the stake. And uh, that's one of the things that we have to. I mean, it is the Torah that's taken away because if the Torah is taken away, if the instructions of Yahuwah's thoughts and how how he defines the relationship, if that's taken away then it's open-ended and we can do whatever we want and just have fuzzy feelings and, and have a relationship with him on our terms rather than his. And that's not ever offered. You know, unconditional behavior <laughs> is not offered. You know, he is very conditional. And he, even in Yeshayahu chapter 56, he talks about that. That everyone who who observes the Sabbath, all the people, that, they're, that whoever they may be, will be welcome, you know. But now what about the people that don't observe the Sabbath? Like today I had a, a tough time struggling to get out of that place early enough because I usually don't work today. But my uh, co-owner at the shop or the store isn't in, in the city right now for a couple of days. So... He's not here, so I had to close early enough to get out of there so that I could be home for Sabbath. And it it's was the uh, sixth day for you, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's just the beginning of Sabbath right now. The sun is set, and it just started to get dark now. So Sabbath has just started. Yeah. Seventh day. Until you get Yahushua inside you, you don't tend to realize the whole concept of um, like John 1 he, he is the he is the Torah you can't separate Yahusha or the Messiah from yeah. the Torah you can't change the Torah it's like it's who he is he is the Torah yeah it's, yeah he's yeah. in us and he's operating in us if we're his people and that's an interesting thing because you know this word right here manna <clears throat> is an interesting word because when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, which we are in the wilderness, when the children were in the wilderness, they went out to find this on the ground after the after the dew left, 
And they had to get it quickly because, see, as the sun would become warmer and warmer, it would evaporate and it would be gone. So they had to get out there and get busy. But this is actually a Hebrew word that means, what is it? Well, interestingly enough, there's another level of what we were talking about. Who is Yahusha? And what is the bread from heaven? Because it says the bread from Shamayim literally came down and fed the children of Israel for 40 years. And, it, and here's the thing. What is the real bread from heaven? And Yahushua gave us the answer. It's him. It's, his, it's he is the bread from heaven. And that's the thing that that was a picture of, a shadow. It's so amazing. And now we eat him and we taste him. And he's very good because we let him in and we receive him. See, the, the children of Israel had to receive the man. They could have left it on the ground and not eaten it and gone hungry. But Yahushua said, he is the, is the manna. He's the bread from heaven. God. And he's the waters. So, you know, he's the Torah. He's the living instructions. And they're living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so when we read the covenant, we're reading a covenant of sincere perfection about love. It's a marriage. And it's so awesome. Mm -hmm. But we're joined. That's what the, that's what it's talking about. You know, in Yeshayahu 56, it, it talks about whoever joins himself in, in a marriage covenant, of course, to Yahuwah and loves his name and all who keep the Sabbath, you know, are welcome. And we're, uh, we're all one, you know, if we do those things, if we love his name. And he won't give us his covenant unless we accept and receive his name. But then mm. vice versa, if we, if we will not obey his covenant, he will not let us receive his name. So we just say, oh, you know, it doesn't matter what we call him. That, that's the sure sign. If you're saying, oh, it doesn't really matter what we call him. What we call him? He gave us his name and we're, re we're going to make up a name for him? Uh oh, that's a sure sign that a person has not accepted his covenant. You know, and uh, it's interesting because one of the commandments that we'll hopefully get to cover tonight or this morning for you will deal deal with his name. You know, this name right here. Yes. Yeah. You know? yeah. Wow. Yes. When you said that we have to eat of Yahusha, a lot of people would be going, "What?" <laughs> yeah, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Yeah. Uh, that would be a bit like when Yahushua said, he who drinks my, what does he say? He who eats my flesh or drinks my blood cannot, and half of them walked away and went, oh, that's madness, you know. So that's, that's pretty nasty. We aren't going to think about this anymore. We're done. We're, we're, uh, not, we're not doing a Catholic thing here. We're not doing a transubstantiation thing, are we? We're not no. eating and doing magic. It's about receiving the manna. It's mm. about receiving mm. him. He is the... The, the tree of life, you know, he's he's ready to give us the nourishment of life. You know, the tree of life gives nourishment from its food, and the food that it gives us is life. And, of course, that was what was fed to the Israelites for 40 years, too. But, you know, we're, uh, we're not in bondage uh, to men's laws. You know, like the Pharisees made up a list of all kinds of things. You can't do this, 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 this. They had everything worked out. And that was the yoke that they put on the people. The yoke that Yahuwah has to give us, we'll read it. And it's very easy and light. And it's living. And it's active. And it's something that we, our hearts really yearn for if we just surrender to it. But we just, uh, are, we, but most people are programmed against it, you know. They'll say, oh, yeah, well, it's a good thing not to murder and steal and commit adultery and all that but, and lie. But, it, you know, resting on the Sabbath, that's legalism. You know, it's being lawful, you know. But We'll still take your money, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, they'll do that. Why didn't, but, he nail, uh, why didn't he nail that to the cross while he was at it, since he nailed everything else to the cross? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He didn't. He, he wants uh, the, the poor to be taken care of, 
in their temporary need. I mean, you know, and then there's people who have permanent needs. And then there's people that uh, are fatherless. They're children. They have to be cared for. They've lost their father. And there's women who are widows. There's uh, foreigners who have been ejected from a land because of a war. We need to take temporary care of those people. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that have to be done. But now, the... Uh, <clears throat> The Levitical priesthood was to receive 10% of the first fruits. Now, it wasn't money. It was food or sheep or, or goats or rams or oxen. That's what it was. And they put it in the storehouse, you know, and not a bank. They didn't put it in the bank. They had to put it in a storehouse. And this was meted out first for themselves to survive because they weren't farmers and so forth. So they were sustained. But there was a lot left over to take care of the needy, you know. So the, the Levitical priesthood was the one that operated at that time to take care of the poor, the widow, the foreigner, and of course the, the child, the uh, fatherless. And that was who it was for. But uh, nowadays we have... Uh, a different system, but most people are not farmers now. 90% of the people, maybe 100 years ago, used to be farmers and various things. They work the land, but now we're in a more urban area, so we have to consider the 10% that we have to look at our local area and take care of those that are in need. And of course, the ones that are wealthier can also help uh, support uh, his work where it's being done correctly and uh, get, it, get it out there. You know, and that's a voluntary, you know, entirely. But uh, how would we begin? With the everlasting covenant, um, it just left me. With the, the everlasting? Ever, yeah, with the everlasting covenant, um, it wasn't instituted at Sinai, was it? He was reminding the people, like they say, oh, well, I forget what they say. But <laughs> Adam would have been doing the covenant. Adam, if Yahusha, Yahua, the Creator, is is His word, is His covenant. It's it's just part of His personality, who He is, what He stands for. Then yeah. Adam, Adam and Kua would have been living by that those uh, instructions, as would have Abraham and all Yahuwah's people. And it was just that they went into captivity into paganism practically and forgot about it for 400 years yeah. that he had to remind them at Sinai. That, that was the gist, wasn't it? Well, yes. If you wanted to track all the covenants back and make a real rigid graph or a chart and say, well, here's the covenant with Abraham or Abram and then and the next one and the next one and the next one. You could do that. But, you know, in reality, he is in his temple and he's in his people and he's guiding us in all truth and uh, just pretty much as it was in the days of Adam and Kwa when they were in the garden. And they didn't have a list of things necessarily. We have to have that, though, because we're in a world of uh, that's really dark. And we have to understand what those things mean, every word. Uh, everything that he, he gives us, we have to understand it. But... Uh, there's somebody that's running around on the earth that's a creature, as you all know, that's an enemy of, of Yahuwah, and he's made himself an enemy. He has followers, fallen Malachim, and this person is identified in the scriptures as the enemy of the bride and the enemy of the covenant. He's against marriage. He's tearing up marriages left and right. He's against the institution of marriage. He's mostly against the covenant, which is a marriage. The, the marriage covenant at Sinai. That's uh, when Yahushua started to call himself Israel's husband. You know, was I not a husband to you? You know, and, uh, and, the, and the wife was committing harlot uh, adultery by worshiping other deities. You know, but uh, I have a, a place here in uh, Yeshayahu, chapter fourteen, verse twelve. This enemy is identified in the text as Hillel ben Shakar. Now that's translated in various ways. <laughs> in the King James, uh, the, the, he, he's called, uh, br uh, what is it, uh, Lucifer. This word, instead of the, the word Hillel, 
that means brightness. The King James translates, translates it into a Latin word, Lucifer. And then Ben means sun of the dawn, Shakar. Hillel, brightness. Ben, that's sun of the dawn. Now we're referring to a particular thing, the, the sun. So this deity that, that is a, just a creature is pretending to be all sorts of different things. And he is an actor. He'll become, he'll work it under whatever name you want to give him, as long as, uh, you know, you worship him. And uh, anyway, he's been in charge of the earth. And uh, he was the covering Malachim, and he's a deceiver. Of course, we know the sun is not a deity, but he had the people believing it was, and they worshipped it under the name B-A-A-L or M-O-L-O-C-H. Uh, there's a, a whole list of different names, but it's all the adversary. Sometimes a witch or a Satanist will get in an argument, and they'll say, oh, well, we don't worship Satan. Witches don't worship Satan. Uh, and then the, <laughs> the Satanist will go, well, we don't do what you do. We don't think of uh, A-S-H-E-R-A-H or the moon or any of that stuff. We're, we're strictly into Satan, you know. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know, They get into arguments all the time. They, they have all kinds of disagreements about it. But yeah. if they're in rebellion against Yahuwah, then they are worshiping Satan yeah. or the adversary, Hashitana. Yeah. And uh, it's this guy that we talked about, Hillel, the son of the dawn, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's just we, the title. We saw an episode of um, Boston Legal about a year ago where they were, there was this Christian and this Wiccan, and they were having an argument. Wow. <laughs> we're just laughing, going, it's similar to what you were just saying then. It's all the same stuff. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Because they're worshiping somebody they call the Lord, which is the Hebrew word B A A L. Yeah. And they don't know who they're worshiping. Hmm. They just obey, uh, you know, and, you know, the identity thief is stealing who is the identity. Uh, his name, Shem, that's the word Shem that means Hebrew name. So they've stolen the name, and this is the name, you know. So. Uh, is, that, is that why some people call him Hashem? That is a lot. There's a lot of uh, people that are Nazarene who call him Hashem. And they substitute that whenever they're reading the text, which is actually part of the commandment not to do. In the third commandment, we're not to destroy or lay waste or annihilate his name. And if we annihilate his name, then we're not using his name. Mm. We've substituted it with something else. And the translators, in the preface of every translation, you can almost find it easily. Just go to the preface and the, and the translators will tell you that they remove his name. And they're putting in a device in the place of his name. Wow. And they admit this. You know. so, so when the, when he said, call me by my name, he didn't say, call me name. <laughs> he said, call no, me. he didn't. My name is Hashem. <laughs> ha, ha is the, and Shem yeah. is name. Hashem is the yeah. name. Yeah. Call me the name. Call me Hashem. No, he didn't do that. Yeah. He wants yeah. his, he, he will not give his esteem to any other. Mm. He said, my name is Yahuwah, and I will not give my esteem to any other. <laughs> and uh, they don't get it, you know, because mm. they're reading a translation where his name is missing. So it's uh, lost the uh, power you know, yeah. of his name. You know, when you, when you want to justify the fact that the word B-A-A-L actually means L-O-R-D, just look it up in a Webster's. Look up B-A-A-L. Look at this word, B-E-E-L, which is just a, a letter change. It's really B-A-A-L, Zebub, the Lord of the Flies, hmm. the Lord of the Flies. And who is that? The dragon. It's the dragon, yeah. Hmm. And that's just an identity thief doing that. But we're trying to wake people up and, you know, say, hello, hmm. you know, hmm. we're... Uh, do you want to read the covenant now, or do you let's, want to start let, it? Let's kick Pardon? it off. Let's go. All right. Yeah. Well, let's see where we uh, have that right here. Uh, this would be a translation into English 
And we're using the 1998 version of the scriptures from ISR, the Institute for Scripture Research. And I like to start with Deuteronomy, the version of Deuteronomy, because it is specifically stated that this is for the scattered tribes in the last days. Uh, Exodus, or Shemoth chapter 20, is uh, the verbatim voice of Yahuwah being spoken from Sinai. We could do either one, but this is uh, intact as well. Deuteronomy 5, starting at verse 6, says, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You do not have other mighty ones against my face. Now, that would be the first commandment. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. That's the first uh, two commandments right there. You know? Now, what, what, is there anything that pops out at you there? I mean, who could argue with that? No, boy. Is there an issue that we, I mean, <laughs> Do we want to change any of the words, especially his name in there? And like, well, we don't want to use that word. Well, let's use another word. Let's have a vote. <laughs> you know, we have to use his name, you know. It's his, uh, it's his identity, you know. But uh, now the next commandment actually specifically addresses that. So let's, let's look at the third commandment. Here it is. Uh, where is it? Come on. I have to find it. There it is. Okay, now I'm going to read this translation, and then I'm going to interpret it a little bit better. It says, in, starting in verse 11 in Deuteronomy 5, You do not bring the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to naught. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who brings his name to naught. Now we'll stop right there. There's two words in here that are essential. The name of Yahuwah is in the commandment. Now, but it, it, there's two other words that are misinterpreted a little bit by people when they hear it. Because when they hear the traditional uh, Catholic style, it's, uh, how do they say it? Uh, do not you take do not my take name in vain. His name in vain. The word take and the word vain are not exactly clear. Because you don't take a name, do you? But the word in, in the Hebrew can be taken that way uh, as, a, as an interpretation, but it's not exactly a good way of explaining it. Because what the, this commandment is saying is it's using the word nasta. Now let me find, I have a, I think I've got a flash card for that. Now this is not the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This is a Hebrew word. NASA. Now, NASA does lift up quite a bit of stuff. They're lifting it up all the time. But that's what it means. It means to lift it up. So when we look at something and we read it, we go, well, that's the word NASA. Well, that's what we're doing. We're lifting up that word. Well, if we lift up his name, then or miss his name, or, you know, whatever, that's not good. We, we don't want to miss his name when we lift it up. Now, uh, the word nasa also means to throw or to cast. So it's like throwing something. In other words, when we speak, we're throwing. We're throwing something out. Now, we're not throwing it away, though. We're, we're, we're speaking. It's spoken out. So we're casting it. We're lifting it up. We're throwing it. Now, here's the, here's the next thing. Uh, well... This is the word name, the name of Yahuwah. He mentions the word name in the commandment. Shem, Yahuwah. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Don't want to throw this thing away. Now, where is that one where I have it? Here it is. Now, in the in the next part of this, he mentions these two words twice. You do not nasa the name of Yahuwah your Elohim 
to not, which means, which is the Hebrew word Shoah. Now, people that know the word uh, for Holocaust, you know, once a year, there's a an annual remembrance day of the of the Holocaust, and it's it's called Yom HaShoah, the day of the Holocaust, and it's a remembrance of what Nazi Germany did, and it also remembers the temple being destroyed, you know, uh, both times. So Yom HaShoah was the day that the temple was destroyed when the Babylonians attacked, and Yom HaShoah that the temple was destroyed when Titus attacked under the Romans in 70 CE. But the word Shoah means utterly laying waste. It means destruction. Now, if, if this word is in this commandment, it means annihilation. Now, you do not cast or lift up the name of Yahuwah to annihilation. You don't annihilate the name. If you, t if you do that, then you've destroyed his name. It's not using it improperly that's so much talked about here. That would be a curse. But if you curse his name, it would be using it improperly, misuse. It's not so much misuse. It's destruction. It's annihilation. Now, that's what they were doing, you know, and they eventually wound up doing. But here's the thing. It says it twice in here. Because for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished, who... Uh, brings or casts his name to utter you know, annihilation or, or, you know, ruin. That's the third commandment. I mean, it's got its own commandment. It's amazing. So he's really set up a protection around that, that his name. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's not serene. That's what we like to do. We like to defend and guard and protect his name, you know, because if we don't use it, then we're not... We're not doing it. But now, uh, the fourth commandment, the covenant sign, that's really exciting. This is the fourth commandment, starting at verse 12 in Deuteronomy 5. Guard, that's shamar. That means to watch over very carefully. Guard, the Sabbath day, to set it apart as Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day, that's the seventh day, not any seventh day, is a Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your servant, male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. That's amazing. Uh, and that's very clear. There's no uh, skirting that. <laughs> no. I was just thinking. Uh, I had a flashcard that really brought out a, a nice part of that one. Let's see. Uh, no. Can't find it. But that's all right. The idea, though, is that we're to rest on the seventh day. And he blessed the seventh day. when he In, in the week of creation, Yahuwah stopped his working, he completed his work in six days, and he rested on the seventh day, and the day occurred, I mean, he was stretching out time, creating time, and there it was, seventh day, and he blessed it. It's the only day of the week that he blessed. Now, the blessing is still there. It's just like the blessing that he put on Ephraim. It's still there, but how many people are aware of it? You know, so when we found out about this, you know, back, you know, a long time ago, individuals found out and came, they remembered the Sabbath day because that was, that was, that's what the commandment says in, uh, in Exodus 20. See, it doesn't say remember here, but it says guard because they were already in it. But when he was giving the commandment at Sinai in Exodus 20, he was saying, remember. So recall this, you know. Do you, um, for anybody who might want to argue this, where is where are the texts? There's probably lots of them that state that this uh, Sabbath, the Sabbath, Seventh Day Sabbath, is the covenant sign. Wow. Well, well, there's uh, the best place that I found is in 
Yehezkel or Ezekiel chapter 20. And of course, we have to look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30 and 31. And uh, if you read those, yeah, those, and those are really amazing. Now, Isaiah or Yeshiahu chapter 56. If you read that, oh, don't forget. Yeshiyahu or Isaiah chapter 66. Wow, I, that's an amazing one right there. Because you know what? It's actually talking about, let's go to Isaiah or, you know, Yeshiyahu 66. And let's look at that. All right, watch this. Let's look at verse 22 of chapter 66. In, in Yeshiyahu or Isaiah. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make stand before me, declares Yehua, so your seed and your name shall stand. And it shall be that from new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares Yehua. And they're going to go out and look at the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. What's that say? Well, that's after the, you know, the last great day, probably. You know, I mean, the corpses of the men who transgressed against me. And remember when Yahusha himself said, pray that your flight, and this is Matthew, or Matthew chapter 24, I believe. He says, pray that your flight does not occur in winter. Or, on a Sabbath. And that's not Sunday. See, the adversary has been running the show. He's talking about the last days there. He's talking about eschatological days. Eschatology. That means the extreme last days. So if Yahushua is talking about all these things that are going to happen, and then in the extreme last days, that you should pray that your flight would not be in winter or on the Sabbath, then uh, why, what, 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 he's talking about the seventh day. So you know, it is like, <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, but Constantine changed that in the year 321. You know, with the Edict of Constantine, you can look it up on the internet. Uh, now, who stand, whose word stands forever? Is it going to be Yahushua's words, or is it going to be Constantine's words? You know, there's nobody. To, no, there's no reason to get ex excited or, or angry. Just abandon the lie. And just say, oh, well, we don't we don't listen to guile. We're just going to leave this place and go someplace else. We don't have to be here at all anyway. Because in Exodus or Shemot chapter 16, it says, let no man go out of his vicinity or his place on the Sabbath. In other words, don't go bothering those Levite or Levitical priests. Don't be bothering your neighbor. Just stay in your place. You know, there's no reason to go outside the camp, you know, for the manna. You know, see, the manna was uh, even used to tell them what day of the week it was because they lost that. See, the seven-day week was lost when they were in under the dragon in Mitzrayim or Egypt. So they didn't know anything about a Sabbath. You know, these were generations. They were there for 400 years. Now, some people say, you know, it was only 230 or whatever. But it says uh, in other places that, you know, the prophecy to Abram, that they were going to be captive for 400 years. So they lost the Sabbath. And uh, he had to reprogram them. And he did this with manna. And it's very important to him because it's the sign of the everlasting covenant. And, uh, and it's a covenant of hasid, or loving kindness. It's a good covenant. It's a good, wonderful thing. Every commandment is pure and clean. And there's no reason to, to not like them. You should love them. You know, if you fall in love with the commandments, you're falling in love with the, the bread from it, the bread. And that's Yahushua. You're falling in love with him. Because that this is his heart. The, the the Ten Commandments that we're reading here. Let's look at the next one. A few um, um a, a few yeah. sessions ago you were saying about the Sabbath that uh by resting on the Sabbath as our creator did, as Yahuwah did we are we are declaring that Yahuwah is our Elohim. 
Uh, everybody in the world is trying to take that away. Humanism, evolution, religion, trying to take the name away, trying to take his identity away. So by resting on the Sabbath, we're, we're doing what he did. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, we are identi identified with him. So the dragon and the world, the cosmos, is actually at odds with us. We're in a battle and that's why the war in heaven is engaged, and only we're only in the we're only a, a soldier in that army when we're immersed and we join to the covenant, and that that's the reason that we're soldiers. That's why we're attacked because we feel the pressure of the war, and the uh, and the enemy is constantly coming up with all kinds of reasons for attacking us. But we're not doing it. We're not doing this to make them feel bad or to attack them. We're just doing something innocently because we love him. But they can't stand it, you know, because the light is penetrating the darkness, and the darkness does not is not able to overcome that light. And because we're the light of the world, he's the light of the world, and he inside us it makes us the light of the world also. And so the light is being displayed right in front of men's eyes and their uh, their their hearts are wicked and so they they don't like it you know because it makes them feel bad and we're not judging them we it's our behavior that's that's showing the difference now the the next commandment is number 5 and this is the beginning of the last six which has to do with the second uh, well the first four basically are love Yahuwah with your whole heart, mind, and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. See, the key word is love. It's not like make your neighbor feel guilty. Uh, it isn't about that. It's about love. And if we make them feel guilty, we should be hurting inside and say, oh, no, I'm not better than you. I'm unworthy as well. It's just that, you know, what we have to do is what we have to do. You know, Adam said it pretty good one day. He said, uh, I'm going to do what I know I should have been doing. <laughs> and that's all we have to really do. Now, say that, the, the say next, that again. <laughs> I, I write things down that people say. Adam said, I'm going to do what I knew I should have been doing. Yeah. I have all these things. Anyway. The fifth commandment is the first commandment that has to do with loving your neighbor. Respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah, your Elohim, has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah, your Elohim, has given you. That's a wonderful commandment. Who can have fault with that? You know, love uh, to respect and honor and obey your father and your mother. And, of course, you don't want to get contentious and say, well, what if you, if they did this? And what if they did that? Well, just respect them, you know, and, and do what is right, you know. Let's not get into hypotheticals. Now, number six, you do not murder. Now, that includes ambushing or premeditated things. Now, if you have an accidental thing going on, you have an accident on the highway or you're uh, working with your axe and you're splitting wood and the axe handle flies off and you're going, where'd it go? And it's, oh, I hit somebody and they die. That's not murder. It's an accident. Of course, you should check your axe. Make sure it's not, you know, before you get, get that thing out, check it out. Make sure it's really on there. And check your car. And don't drive too fast, and don't follow too closely, and don't change lanes improperly without signaling. Always change lanes improperly with your signal. No, no, no. Don't change it lanes improperly. You know, just drive as if, if everybody obeyed these Ten Commandments, there would be no, no accidents. There wouldn't even be any accidents. And there would, it would be a day without any news. You know? It would be amazing. Uh, now, here's the next one. Uh, this would be number seven, starting at verse 18. You do not commit adultery. Now, I want to show you how simple this is. <clears throat> Let me find out. 
what that looks like. Let's see. All right, here it is. The uh, the word the whole commandment, you do not commit adultery, is actually just two Hebrew words. One is lo, which means no. And the other one is naha, naaf. Naaf means to break wedlock, you know, to break your covenant with your wife. So it's just two Hebrew words. And the same is true of the commandment before that, no kill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and in this case, it's uh, lo ratzak. Ratzak means to murder someone. Ratzak. And uh, lo ratzak means no killing, no murdering. See? Now, the, uh, the Orthodox have rules about what kind of bugs you can kill. Like, oh, that bug, you're, that's legal to kill that bug. Oh, but you can't kill this bug. I don't know what the bugs are, but it, let's imagine that one of them is a deadly spider and the other one is not a deadly spider. Or uh, a little happy little uh, ladybug or a little uh, firefly. If you kill one of those, then you've violated the command. Well, uh, you, I don't think Yahuwah's intentions are... You know, of course, you don't want to be maliciously killing anything, you know, but that would be a bad heart. Something's wrong. But if you're out there stamp, stamping on ants, you know, just because you want to see them die, that's uh, maybe not quite right, you know. There's something very wrong. <laughs> but, you know, maliciousness, you know. Uh, but this is talking about people, you know. That's what it's talking about. But I just wanted you to see how simple these commandments were. Now, let's see. Moving right along. All right. The, uh, eighth, the eighth command is you do not steal. Now, if I remember correctly, that would be lo ganab. So if you're ganabbing stuff, like, let me ganab that. I don't know how to have that. And that's ganabbing. <laughs> you know, we have, we have this um, word here in the United States where if you nab something, if you're nabbing it, that means you're grabbing it. And I bet you that the word grab actually comes from that word ganab. No ganab. In other words, no stealing. You know. Interestingly, really? interestingly, our uh, what we call a rat poison over here is called rat sack. Oh, yes. You saw that? Well, that's a direct Hebrew connection. Yeah. Just like uh, in Hawaii, they have that direct connection with the uh, kahuna. Yeah, the, you, most everybody's aware of the big kahuna. Hmm. Well, kahuna is a Hawaiian word, but kahuna comes from the Hebrew root from the word kohen, which means priest. So the big kahuna, of course, we know as Yahushua. You know. But uh, anyway... All right, now this is a good one. Oh, they're all good. Uh, aren't they wonderful? If you had a neighbor that lived next to you that kept these commandments, you would be able to say, well, I can lock my door. I don't have to lock my doors. I don't have to worry about him coming after my wife. I don't have to worry about him murdering me. You know, he's going to be a fine neighbor. You know, that's what this is all about. Your neighbors, loving your neighbors. And watch this. Number nine is you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And there it is. And that's the commandment. Now, the last commandment is kind of like got two things in there, but it's about property. Although in this world, we don't consider, uh, I've had people ask me, the covenant of a, man, of a, of a person, of a, of a woman's husband isn't in the commandment. Well, that's because property uh, husbands weren't usually considered property, but in the ancient world, a man owned his wife. You know, that was his, and no one else's. But of course, we don't think of it as, uh, you, you know, something that's not valuable. It's, it's something, I, could, I possess my wife, and I am her property as well. And Paul talks about that in his writings, that she has 
Every bit of right to me is I have right to her. So we're equals. But don't misunderstand that. But I'm just saying the commandment, people have asked me, what is the reason why it doesn't say you did not covet your neighbor's husband? You know. And that's pretty much why. Because in the world that this is coming from, it's not thought of as uh, in the same way we do today. But let's look at it, though. You do not uh, covet, that means to, to desire, your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now, of all those things, there's only three of them that I could actually find next door to me, and that would be the, the neighbor's wife, the neighbor's house, maybe his field. And uh, that's about it. But uh, whatever belongs to your neighbor covers everything else. So I'm not going to be able to break into my neighbor's house while he's at work and uh, like steal his tools or something out of his house that I like, like his stereo system or his computer. Uh, <laughs> but there's people that do that, you know, they're thieves, you know, and no thieves are going to enter into the kingdom. So anyway, this commandment is actually linked somewhat to the commandment about stealing because when you understand that you don't even want it, you don't desire it, then you're not going to ever steal it, you know. There's a very That's strong pull from the world to desire, even if you're not a thief and you have no intention of stealing anything, to be looking and wanting and um, that can drive you crazy, particularly when you're coveting your brother and sister's stuff. That's that drove me crazy for years, and it's a damn yeah, spiral. Looking at other people, and oh, you get so angry, and you, you just go crazy in the head. It's um, well, yeah. You know, I mean, there's people that want hairstyles. I'm sure that they're 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 coveting someone's hairstyle. You probably deal with a little bit of that, you know, at, at some level. But you see, right here in the commandments, we've got we're talking about respecting your father and your mother, which are the it, that's the way he measures. How you treat your parents is, is, he's looking at that relationship very closely because he sees that he's also a father, your father. And if you don't treat your earthly father very well and mother with respect, then how are you going to respect him? But then right here, it's got adultery and stealing. And then the last commandment covers those things too, only at another deeper level where it's even in your inside. You're, he's, he's got your outsides covered, but you see, even inside, he, he's measuring, he's reading the way you are inside your heart, inside your being. And uh, that's an amazing thing, because Hebrews chapter 4 discusses how this particular thing, this, these, this covenant, this marriage covenant, is able to discern and divide like a two-edged sword between uh, joints and marrow and between the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And these words are that you have spoke to all the, your assembly in the mountain, in the midst of the fire. This is a place where in Deuteronomy, Moshe is remi reminding them of when Yahuwah spoke these things and shook the earth and, and scared them half to death. So if we find uh, if we find ourselves in a bit of a place where we're down or we've got uh, pressure or depressed or we've got ourselves into a state, more time we could probably trace it back to the covenant and find one of those and say, oh, I've, I've broken my covenant. That's why I'm feeling the way I am. I'm I've not necessarily stolen something, but I'm desiring something. I'm wanting I'm wanting something. I'm you know, my flesh is screaming for something, you know. Uh, where it's our it's our marriage vows, it's our covenant with Yahuwah. And we're constant we're constantly breaking it. Yes, uh, you Yahuwah uses a lot of metaphoric language where Something is given as an example, but it's pointing to something of greater importance than the example that he gives. And those are parables and 
and the, the discussion with the woman at the well, living water. See, it's not water that he's talking about. It's, it's something else. It's him. And he wants to be in us and controlling us. And if we just say, I give up, I don't want to control my life. Even if it goes bad, I know that it'll end up better than it would be if I was in charge. Because, uh, I mean, I've had times where I don't think I ever reached the level where Nebuchadnezzar did, where he was saying, look at all this stuff that I did. Oh, my. But there's been times when every one of us have been prideful about something. And those are the times when I just say, oh, no, let's not do that. Let's just nail this thing right now and say, Yahuwah is the one that does all this. Yahuwah built Babylon. You know, <laughs> it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. It was, see, he's, he's the creator, you know. And everything that was given to Nebuchadnezzar was given to him by Yahuwah. You know? So we have done nothing. You know, it's all Yahuwah. In fact, there's a command, there's a scripture here. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of Yahuwah and his righteousness, which is these commandments. You know, and then when you when you think about seeking first the kingdom, well, what is our first love supposed to be? You know, in Revelation 2, verse 4, it talks about, you know, you have forsaken your first love. You know, you've you've abandoned it. You 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 have to go back. You know, to the ancient past, and he is that manna. He's that. He's the bread. And, and this this is what we're talking about. What we're what we're we just read is actually bread. It's life. But but you see, those are metaphors. The bread is a metaphor for life. You know. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, it is. It's amazing. But uh, when we understand that that was not nailed to the tree, and we say, well, these are good things. What would, what would it be like in the world if all ten commandments were obeyed? In the Hebrew, they're called Eseret Hadabarim. Eseret is the number ten. Hadabarim means the words Hadabarim, the ten words. If all the world kept all ten of those words perfectly from the inside, from their heart, and that includes the coveting part, there would be people backing off in traffic and going, whoa, I've got three car links. Uh-oh. You know, and they wouldn't be, uh, like, trying to get ahead of everybody, you know, in the traffic. Oh, I'm going to cut that truck off. I don't care. And then some family dies, you know, because they cut them off. Well, you know, if everybody didn't do those sorts of things, if their behavior was different or they preferred the other person to get their way rather than them getting their way, you know, and going crazy, uh, there would be no accidents. There would be no uh, robberies. There would be no burglaries. Uh, there would be... There would be deaths, I'm, I, I'm sure, but, you know, there wouldn't be anybody murdering anybody. Uh, people do have to die. You know, there's a day that's appointed for everybody. But there would be sadness, but there would be no news other than, you know, the obituaries, maybe. I mean, who, what are you going to report? Nothing at all happened today because everybody kept the commandments. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, because most of the things that we read about and hear about on radio and television and the internet is because somebody blew up a bomb or somebody uh, had a terrible accident that was caused because of negligence. You know, there would be no negligence. We'd be careful. Hmm. You know. Of course, I have acrophobia. I'm afraid to get up on the ladder. You know. But, you know, that's another issue. But, uh, you know, if everybody kept the commandments, though, there would be uh, there would be no wars. In fact, if there were wars, the day the, the, the day would they take the day off? They say, <laughs> "Well, we're not killing you today." Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. But uh, there is a another covenant, and it involves the land. And the land covenant has to do with circumcision 
and it's an outward sign. It's one of those signs that we talked about. And it's a covenant, brith, milah, brith, milah. And that's, uh, you know, when on the eighth day, the male is to be circumcised. And that is a sign of the land covenant, because it has it's tied to the land. It's not a salvation thing. And that's why in uh, Acts chapter 15, if you read all of Acts chapter 15, then something will emerge. Oh, these people were coming over and saying that these Gentile men are not circumcised. They cannot be saved. Oh, yes, they can. Even in their uncircumcised state, because it's circumcision done by Yahushua in your heart. That's the true circumcision. And of course, a lot of people are really mad now because some of the viewers, some of the viewers of this, are, you know. Now, when we have children, though, we are expected to have them circumcised on the eighth day, male children. Yeah. You know. And uh, I understand it. it. I don't know this much about it, but there's there's actually re religions out there where females are circumcised, and that's heinous and gross. And I don't want to mention it, but you can find that out. That it's not right, and of course it's a spinoff of some somebody that got a wacky idea, you know, at some point in the past. And men tend to follow like lemmings behind each other. Well, that's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we do. And then generation after generation, that's where we get these generational strongholds, you know, like well, my parents taught me to do this. So that's what I'm going to teach my children. And that's what they do with the bunny rabbits and the colored eggs and the trees and the reeds and the lights and all that. And uh, they don't even know where it comes from, you know. That's part of the pressure if you step into the covenant because you are yeah. breaking something. Yep. And many times they take it very personal that you don't want to do yeah. what we've brought you up to do. Yes. And it's it's not a personal thing. It's just uh, we love you, but um, Taurus yeah. is this. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why Yahushua was saying that, uh, uh, you know, he brought a sword to the earth. And uh, the enemies of a person would be in their own household, you know. And it was because one would find out what pleased Yahuwah and would not do the things that they were doing before. And we don't run with the same people that we used to run with and do the things that they do, because we stop that. We're new creations. We go into the water, and that's that immersion. When we call upon the name of Yahushua for the forgiveness of our sins against this covenant, then we become a new creation, and our sins are washed away and never thought of again. They're, they're put up on that, you know, chera grafan. They're... They're completely wiped away. They're, they're taken out of the hands of the prosecutor. <laughs> and the prosecutor goes, well, uh, I don't have anything against this one either. Next. And then, well, whoops, there it goes again. <laughs> but then <laughs> the ones that are not covered by the blood of Yahushua, the prosecutor is going to hold the, their accusations and say, well, what have we here? You did not accept the atoning blood. What about that? And then, and then they're cooked. You know, it's going to be bad. Let's just not do that. But uh, we always got the uh, we always got taught the analogy that uh, there's going to be a, a big screen up, and it's just going to push rewind, and you're going to see every single thing that you ever did in your life that was against the covenant. Uh, and you would. You would if that was if if the evidence was still in existence, mm. but mm. And for most people it will be in existence because they did not accept the covenant, and the blood the blood of the covenant is the thing that cleanses our hearts. It sprinkles our hearts, and it has changed everything because we have a relationship on a day to day, minute to minute, second to second by second with our Creator, mm. and. Those that don't have that relationship are the ones that those accusations remain. Wow! Phyllis, Phyllis said it's already been an hour. Did you believe that? 
Yeah. I well, have so much. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Beautiful. That's amazing stuff, brother, about the covenant. We better let the girls have their time. You will know? do. We'll do. Well, well, that's that's the covenant, brother. We've we've discussed the covenant and the Ten Commandments, and, and that's it's the yes. only thing that we're going to take out of this world. Mm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, fantastic. Love you, mate. Love you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now I should turn on. Oh, there he is. What? This hey, man. can you see me now? See, him? say hi, Lou. Hi, Lou. <laughs> hi, children. <laughs> You guys are awesome. So this is Luca, and he's just five a few days ago. And this is Brandon, and he's nearly four. You can't see you. Just sit down. <laughs> Where'd you go? Hey, but I can do that too. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this wonderful? That's wonderful. <laughs> he's done it again. And look, there's Phyllis as well. Look. That's what you do. Say hi, Phyllis. Hi, Phyllis. Hey, Phyllis. Hi. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> we watch videos of you guys all the time. Your dad sends them to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there he went. Where'd he go? I don't know. There he is. Okay. Well. Lou and I are going to talk about the Ten Commandments today. So you know the Ten Commandments, don't you? Come on. How good are you? Come on. What's number one? Love Jesus more than anything else. Is that loud enough? Can you hear that? Yes. What's number two? No idols. Three. Always need you <laughs> Number four. Rest on the Sabbath. Number five. Don't know what they say. What was it? Don't know what they say. <laughs> Number six. Do not kill people. Oh, very good. Number Me. seven. Do not um, look at naked people. Yeah. Number eight. Do not lie. Yeah. I'll steal. Clothes. Number nine. Do not lie. Yeah. Number ten. Do not want to else. Don't want anyone else's stuff, yeah. Very good. Ten Commandments. Where's Brandon gone? Oh. Where are you gone? Oh, <laughs> He's dying now. <clears throat> That's great, isn't it? Ten Commandments. We love the commandments, don't we? We've got to obey the commandments. Yeah. Well, you say bye-bye now, because we've got some talking to do. Bye. Stand bye. Up. Stand up, Brand. Say bye bye. Oh, stand up. Thanks for thanks for coming. That is so nice. Say bye bye, Lou. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> you precious. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay.